Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is the Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, the Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hey, hey, everybody, how you doing? Uh, Steve Martorano with you on the Behavioral Corner. What we do here, this is a great gig, I must say. I get to hang out on a... Uh, an interesting corner, a little bodega across the street, the newsstand down there, and loads of interesting people who cross our path here to talk and enlighten us on the big, big issue of our behavioral health. You know what that is, behavioral health, it's everything we do. So that, you know, impacts our, our well-being, our mental health, our spiritual health, even our physical health. So it's a, it's a broad topic. And we like to say that the Behavioral Corner uh, is a podcast about everything. And it show sure is. It is that indeed. So hang with us. Uh, we, we, we hope you're following us and we hope you're uh, we're shedding some light on some stuff. It is June. There, you know, there's, you know, look, there's a day designated for everything in every month of every year. Um, and uh, gay pride, LGBTQ uh, issues are certainly not alone. They've got a long standing relationship with the month of June which is Pride Month. So we, uh, we've invited somebody in to, uh, to give us some perspective on that. Um, Tyrone Best is a, a young fellow who comes to our attention through our underwriters and partners retreat behavioral health. Um, Ty has worked his way up through a, a couple of rungs there to the communications department. We work, work very closely with Ty's department. Um, and uh, he, he's gonna join us with a unique perspective on both the necessity and the meaning of Pride Month uh, as a young gay man, but also he brings with us a, a story of uh, his substance abuse um, struggle and journey and how he's now achieved five years of sobriety. So this is a good one all the way around. Uh, Tyrone, thanks for joining us on The Corner. How are you? Thank you. Good. How are you? I surprised you a little bit with the video component, didn't I? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't ready. Hans. Handsome young guy like you got to got to get spruced up. <laughs> Television. Yeah. Anyway, it's you know the heart. My guests are all uniformly interesting to look at, and then I just recoil in horror. My gosh, I, I can't do that. That's a that's a career in broad in radio. It's not prepared <laughs> me for looking at myself. Anyway, thanks so much. Uh, uh, four years now at retreat. Uh, yeah, I'll be going on four years in December. Yeah. And uh, as I said, you worked your way up and now you're in the communications department. Um, right. So I, I, I characterize, you know, I characterize you as a young gay man. Uh, so there you are. Uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, Ty, like, or, you know, most of us is made up of many parts. I mean, uh, he likes the outdoors. He likes traveling and kayaking and hiking and he's into meditation. So we only, we, we mentioned his orientation because that's our topic. Mm -hmm. uh, Ty, let me begin at the beginning. People, well-intended people, and some people who are not so well-intended, mm -hmm. look at the LGBTQ, and every time they look at it, there seems to be another letter added, and nobody wants to exclude anybody or appear as though they don't care. Is there a thumbnail that you know the rest of us can go, okay, what's, what's the right thing to say here when talking about that entire universe? So I would say, like, for well, what I learned the right thing to say is we do, we like to say LGBTQ plus community. Plus. Uh, the plus is always more, there always can be, um, there's a lot of different orientations and um, different things that come in with the um, LGBT community. Yeah. So um, we're all learning this process together. Um, we're all growing and we're seeing the world grow. So I think if we're all like bear with it, um, eventually we'll come together, but we have a good standing, just say like LGBTQ plus. Yeah. It's like a great thing to say. Yeah. My, my wife's, my wife's theory is that the goal eventually will be to drop all of this and not pay any attention <laughs> to. Yeah. To eventually we would have to like clarify who and identify who people are um eventually we would just be people and we right. can say that right. and then move past the, the these specific definition and mm -hmm. just 
and just go, okay, who's this person in front of me? Yeah. H- how are they behaving? Do I like them or do they like me? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. it. Exactly. Okay. All right. But, you know, we got we to gotta do it right here. We got to get the nomenclature right. Um, mm-hmm. How old are you, first of all? I didn't ask that earlier. I am 26 years old. Now, you were um, on your way to, uh, I guess, a, a, de- a degree and a, cr- a career in architecture mm-hmm. when you uh, had trouble with uh, substance abuse. Tell us about that. Um, I always wanted to, I was always interested in like designing and drawing um, my whole life. But um, growing up, I was so, the stigma of being a masculine male, I knew that the art that I wanted to do couldn't be like fashion and stuff like that. Cause I was trying to stay away from the, the gay stuff, a part of me, I was trying to like hide that. So I went more into architecture because I was into designing and homes and stuff like that. But that also was more masculine to me. So that was what a lot of my family members and friends knew I wanted to do. So I kind of went with that flow um, after school like after high school, um, did that for two years at Hack. Um, I was going to transfer over, but during those two years after high school, I was really conflicting with my sexuality and becoming an adult and be able to um, identify as a gay man. It was uh, difficult for me. Um, Also, I didn't have like that close-knit of friends as much as I did during those years of high school and middle school and growing up, um, I felt alone. So I know I was on an adventure to do like every drug possible. I was like, let me try everything. Let me live life. And um, during those difficult times, I happened to got into heroin and that got me. It took me um, and it took a hold of me. So like I started using that to hide a lot of my stuff. It calmed sure. me down. Um, but yeah. How, how long How long were you actively using heroin? I would say from the age of, I started at the age of 19 to the age, wait, eight, maybe the end of age of 18 to um, the age of 21. Okay. Uh, and it got serious enough for you to... Uh get yourself some help, right? Uh, how many times were you in treatment? Uh, I only went in once. Ah, good for you. Um, what was the motivation? Was it was it because of uh, legal problems or did you finally get this? I was uh, finally done. Um, I was, eventually I wasn't getting high with friends. I was getting high by myself in my room. Um, dozing out in my room a lot, um, a lot of alone time. Mm -hmm. And I realized some of my friends started realizing that because I would, no one kind of knew that I was on, I kind of hid it from everybody, my family, friends. Um, A friend of mine realized that it was really bad, um, threatened to tell my parents. um, And my mom kind of knew something was going on um, a couple of months prior to me going to rehab and I had came out to her and I told her I was like bye like only like I like girls and guys which wasn't true but that's like the first thing you say right yep yeah um um and she held it a little secret for a little bit um then a couple months later I finally was like crying and was really like done like it was like the end of I mean, I had nothing left. I was selling all my stuff. Um, I was stealing stuff. I was doing all types of things for money. And I was just um, done. So like after, shortly after the semester ended, I came to my mom, told her, and was like, I need help. Mm -hmm. She took me within arms and got me help, called um, my father. (laughs) drove me to rehab and when he was driving me that's when I came out to my father so he found out like oh his son does heroin and now his son is gay but um I think he they took it very well because they knew what it was doing to me 
So you had you had a, a, a you know parents in your life. Uh, any of you, you have siblings? Yes, I have two older sisters. There no, are no drug, yeah, no drug problems there. No, um, the drug history in my family is my mom. Ah, mm-hmm. so there was some history. So she's so, sort of open to that idea. Well, you know what? As I said at the beginning here, you you do bring together a couple of elements of things we talk about, uh, set against the backdrop of your sexual orientation. It, it's immediately apparent to me that there's so much about you know being different being gay or lesbian that we don't appreciate we just sort of look at the surface stuff you said that as a youngster you felt artistic you like to draw lots Mm -hmm. of kids like to draw but because of the confusion if i understood you correctly yeah about how you felt your emerging sexuality you immediately shied away from drawing pretty things mm-hmm. and, oh, and fo- focused your attention on a manly pursuit. Men build buildings, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's what a lot of the straight world doesn't understand about the burden of being a closeted uh, gay person is that it's not just you're hiding sexuality, you're hiding everything. Mm-hmm. Everything. There was your career path set totally in a false way mm-hmm. and didn't work right no <laughs> it didn't work so how so you were what 20 21 when you came out to your parents mm-hmm. tell us about that because uh it, that, that's a terrifying moment isn't it yeah t- t- how did your dad react your mom sounds like she just rolled with it how dad so uh my dad reacted very well actually <laughs> Were you surprised? I was completely surprised. Like the reason why, um, because growing up, he was like, like my dad is great now. He supports me in everything I do now. And he's a wonderful guy. But back then growing up, he was not acceptable for any kind of like female list activity or um like he always wanted me to do like boy things. And um, if I was gay, like, you know, he, I remember as a child him telling me he would like beat my butt, like if I would turn out gay, you know? So like- Why did, wait, wait, before you go, wait, 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 wait. Was he worried? Had you exhibited in hindsight uh, signs that he might've thought my son may be gay? I feel like growing up, my whole family kind of always know. You kind of know. Yeah. Um, it's like that age one to four when you don't, you're just yourself and you don't develop any of characteristics yet from anybody. You don't learn anything yet. You're one to four, you're yourself. So during that time, my mom even said, like, I was playing with my sister's dolls. I would do like certain things that would be more feminine or stigma as more of the gay side. So like, like. And the excuse that we had growing up was, oh, I have two older sisters. I grew up, I grew up with females. I'm, I'm um, uh, more into clothing because that's the type of person I am, like stuff like that. So it was always like, it's just a big stigma on yeah. everything. And, 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 dad's antenna, and dad's antenna was up. His mm-hmm. radar was on and any sign he saw of of not masculinity Mm -hmm. he made he made an issue of so you're sitting in the car i gotta give you this much and i know it's a strange thing to say but in a difficult decision where you have to come out to your father your father yeah particularly the kind of dad you had um you know there's all kinds of times when you can do that Mm -hmm. i suppose as he's driving you to rehab because you've got a heroin habit (laughs) maybe the best time (laughs) yeah right (laughs) He's I was like, it's a two and one. It's a twofer. I can hit him two and one and drop right. me off. And I'll see you in 30 days. You know what? You started you doing drugs because of the confusion and everything. And you find yourself in that spot because of, you know, the pressures of being closeted. And then at this moment, it sort of comes in handy because your father's smart enough to go, okay, let's prioritize here now. Yeah. <laughs> let's I'm get him out. Uh, whoop his ass about being gay later. 
<laughs> I'm laughing. You know it's not funny, but you know what no, I mean? Yeah, I laugh about the story all the time. I'm like, That's brilliant. you know it, what? It it's came almost out. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost a brilliant plan. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't have time. To <laughs> he can't get too freaked out here, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, you, like I said, let's, let's get serious here. Now, a lot of people in your situation don't go to rehab and just get clean. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you do... Not that it matters, but why do you suppose you took to treatment apparently uh, so quickly? Um, I knew like what treatment was from growing up, so I knew that um, like what it was, but like I kind of didn't put it together as I got older and I started realizing the people I was around and the friends that are around started going to rehab. Um, getting help and getting clean and I thought I would everyone thinks they're invincible and they're not that person um, I thought I wasn't that person I thought I wouldn't have to do that that I can just stop on my own and go back to my life apparently that didn't work out right. um, what got me like I just something was in me that I knew that I would was more to this life like my life wasn't just this I knew that um I was able to live myself I was slowly coming out to my friends so like my friends knew I was gay but my family didn't so they were like the last step of the people that I needed to tell and once I told them I knew like I was a little bit free and that I can be free from also like taking in drugs like yeah yeah relieve that yeah. too we know from examples that have nothing to do with uh, orientation that most substance abusers are self-medicating and hiding something else. Mm -hmm, it's correct. a sim it's sort of a symptom of what's really going mm -hmm. on. Uh, and clearly in your case, uh, once you get, you get okay telling people who you really are, uh, I guess the thought occurs to you, well, that's great. And by the way, what am I doing being a heroin addict? I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Ridiculous. Let's get that straight. What was uh, what was withdrawal like for you? What was the detox process like? Like, were you were you shooting it? Or were you doing? Were you in? Yeah. Yes, I was shooting it towards yeah, yeah. my towards the last like four to five months of my run. I was shooting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. It was difficult. I uh, was having nightmares. I I threatened to go home like every day. Mm. I called my parents yeah. like a child every day. I thought I was going to be in, my dad kind of souped me up. He was like, yeah, just give it a week. Give it a week. And we're <laughs> like, no. <laughs> a, week. Well, a week later, I called. I was like, all right, I'm ready to go. And he was like, no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah it was difficult because I had tried to stop many times on my own because I didn't want people to know yeah and even I would try to go a day or two and I would just be like really sick and like my mom would just see me like really sick and she would just think that I'm just tired and sick or something and I would just run out the house because I needed to get like that fixed real quick and act a normal um, there was times I went to like, I had to go to like family birthday parties and I needed to be high to be normal. Cause if I wasn't, uh, they would know that I was like, Something's wrong. I wasn't up to par. Like they knew I was not myself. Yeah. And I always had been a person that, um, wanted to like dress nice, look good. So doing those like years of my times, I was not myself. So it was very, very noticeable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do you look? Yeah, you, you must look back at those times and think, who was that? What was that? Mm -hmm. um, we're talking to Tyrone Best. He comes to us through the communications department uh, from our partners, Retreat Behavioral Health. Uh, it's clear that you know you you chose this the path to get uh, involved in uh, um, treating people who who have been where where you have been in a substance abuse. By the way, Ty, five years now going up, five years now so, right. sober. Five years sober is a big deal, as you know. Congratulations, and good for Thank you. you. Uh, when did you decide you'd stay in uh, in this field? Um, so 
after I got out of treatment, uh, I went back, I started serving, like went back to like serving and stuff like that. Um, um, I started working with a lot of my friends that I grew up with. And this, the story how I started working here was weird. So like my friend that I grew up with, we were working at Arugas together. I uh, left Arugas doing like that same week time frame. It was Thanksgiving. And I went to my friend's Thanksgiving dinner and um, her brother's girlfriend at the time um, was at the dinner and worked at retreat. And she was like, like we were talking about like their family was talking about oh, how I have been like clean for about a, a year and a half now about that time. And they were like talking about different stuff I, like I want to do. And she mentioned retreat and I was like, wow, I can see myself working there, you know. Um, so I applied and I try, uh, ended up getting the job as a CA. And I started off as a CA. Um, and I started liking it because I started communicating with people and talking to people about other things and life experiences and helping other people. And it was making me feel so much better about my life because I was helping others. Yeah. Um, I, I know part of your duties, uh, or, or they were part of your duties, um, with retreat was the in the area of diversity. You still doing that for them? Yeah, diversity. Diversity, yes. Um, and um, tell us about your friend Sean and your foundation that was uh, created by you and your friends. Um, so we started Sean's Legacy in two thousand and nineteen. Um, it was based off of our one of our friends who in the uh, in middle school who killed him uh, well committed suicide um in seventh grade we were young so we kind of didn't know how to take that but we were hurt um and it affected a lot of us um it affected the bullying and stuff that was going on in our school um so years later as we got older we created um a foundation a nonprofit um, organization that um, celebrates or helps LGBTQ um, suicide prevention for the youth. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's based off of him. So we dedicated that for him. Um, and the funny thing is his, um, his day that he passed away was May 19th. And we always used to celebrate May 19th for years. And years later on the universe, my clean day ended up being May 19th. So I ended up working wow. out. Um, and I look up every day and I'm like, wow, like yeah, yeah. weird how that worked out. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a great way to uh, make the point I wanted to ask you about Pride Month. You, you know, the uh, origins of this very quickly is it's be it, Pride, Pride, Gay Pride really began as a recognition, as I understand this of the beginning of the gay rights movement, the Stonewall uh, riots in New York. Mm -hmm. And it was really originally a, a protest against police violence yep. against, against gays. And, and in, the, in the many, many years since then, it has, it has uh, grown into um, what we now call Pride Month, um, yeah. which is a celebration of uh, diversity, I guess. But anyway, uh, your friend Sean is a great example of, that's the answer to the question, well, why do you need to celebrate your orientation? It's, you know, when they see the gay, par gay mm -hmm. pride parades around the country and, and, you know, guys show up, girls show up, it's flamboyance, it's mm -hmm. in your face. People get a little like, what, what's this? I don't, there's no heterosexual pride day, right? Yeah. Right. Sean answers the question of why this day is important, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> like, no one fought for those people that were our whole lives. We were taught to, they say that we're um, gays or people part of the LGBTQ community are not tough enough or the masculinity that comes with being gay. But the, if the whole world is telling you that, it makes you tough enough to deal with everything that's going on in the world. So like, he was, I believe that Sean made 
like I said, Sean's legacy, he made a legacy on us to prove to this world that we need to make a difference um, of what's going on and what's happening in this world because that little, that moment that happened there affected our whole school, affected our whole township and all the schools around us. Mm -hmm. Um, Like bullying programs were getting thrown out like no other. um, And a lot of things were changed because of that. And he made a difference. Were you bullied as a youngster? For sure was. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, let me ask you about, uh, uh, and I know you're not a, you, know, you were a clinical aide, but you know, this is not strictly speaking your your area, but it's, it's worth bringing up, I guess. With regard to the mental health and substance abuse treatment available to uh, LGBTQ uh, community, do you, does it have to be tailored in any specific way because you're dealing with people who are gay or lesbian? I don't think it has to be tailored in any way. I just think uh, people need to listen and have an understanding. If you know how to listen and have an understanding, then um, nothing needs to be tailored. You just need to learn like everyone else is learning and we all learn together every day we learn. So I feel like, um, no, yeah, it doesn't have to be tailored. Well, listen, uh... I can't. You're 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 uh, at the uh, Lancaster facility here in the Pennsylvania area, correct? Uh, and I, I used to be there a lot before COVID took me out of my little studio. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you. And uh, you. you you know, retreat has a uh, a real knack for hiring good people, and and it looks like they've done it again. We will cross paths uh, oh, for again, sure sure. soon. Tyrone Best. Uh, our guest here on the Behavioral Corner, uh, June Pride Month, for real, for real. Um, and uh, we thank you so much. Hey, the rest of you, don't forget, we're here on the corner. You know, follow us, Facebook, you know, write a, write a review. We like that, too. We got thick skin, you know, hit that like button and uh, catch us next time on the corner. Ty, take care. Right, see ya. At Retreat Behavioral Health, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 and begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.